Um, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to QJS on the Road. Uh, first of all, just three slides, who we are. Um, OpenGIS.ch, uh, we are um, open source geospatial experts. And um, oh, hello. <laughs> we are a pretty dynamic young team. Um, love open source above everything. Super focused on um, QGIS, PostGIS, and QField, obviously, which is our product, geodata infrastructure, and so on. We can make basically anything that touches that kind of technologies. We, we know it in pretty much inside out. Um, uh, very short. Um, today uh, is going to be a bit of a different presentation than you're probably used to. Um, we're going to tell you a story. Matthias is going to start, uh, tell you a little bit more about it. The format um, is different. We're going to show you a lot of videos. The whole, the whole thing are videos that we prepared. There is about an hour and 20 minutes of tutorial videos that you will be seeing. We will publish the videos later on with blog posts separated by subject as well. So you will get uh, to be able to see those again. Obviously, you can see the live stream as well recorded. But we will also make a series of five to six posts where we will show uh, the single videos with uh, sample code and so on and so on. So you will be seeing a lot of video with Matthias and myself uh, telling you the story around this video. So to tell you about all these features that we promised you, um, we're going to tell you this by the story of Mrs. Miami Alina and um, all the char characters and the events inside these presentations, they are, they are made up and uh, to, to have it a bit more entertaining. So sometimes while making up these stories, we may have gotten a bit carried away, so we excuse for any ex uh, inaccuracies and uh, I actually hope uh, that there are not too many beekeepers, real beekeepers, uh, around in the audience here because that may be quite tricky. <laughs> so um, this is Miami Alina. After many years working in a geospatial office in Bucharest, she moved back into the village of her childhood while um, retiring, which is uh, La Vertezzo in uh, the Italian-speaking Canton Tigino in Switzerland. And um, she grew actually originally up there. And she was, she's now living in her grandparents' house and remembers all the good times she had with her grandparents there. She um, has now a lot of free time. And she decides that this free time she wants to devote into growing bees and producing honey. And um, actually, because of all her interest in GIS and all the experience she has, she chooses, of course, to use the best GIS software, which is QGIS, and to start her adventures with this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Actually, to um, start uh, deciding if it's worthwhile of uh, growing bees somewhere, you must first check if uh, all the conditions are met. So she wants to check like how the traffic is around here and um, what kind of flora there is already. And maybe there are uh, some neophytes which uh, could disturb her. Um, so she opens QJS and adds a base map with quick map services. And um, <coughs> so she... Uh, opens up um, the locator bar at the lower left by pressing Ctrl K and types in La Vertezzo to find where it actually is. So in the background, this is done by a plugin um, connecting directly to the national, um, to Swiss national API uh, of the mapping services to do all the search. And there is her house. Um, you can see where she just clicked upon where uh, she's now living and starts with it. So. She also wants to um, add some layers now as next, and she also wants to add some layers which are provided by the ma National Mapping Service. She searched so for um, the Swiss GeoPortal WMS layers, which are also found by the Swiss Locator plugin 
um, that provides the backend for the search. And I uh, search for the Lupinus Polyphilus um, layer, which is a neophyte. Um, actually, it wouldn't be bad for her bees to, um, they quite like them a lot, so that would be good for the bees. But on the other hand, to having the neophytes there and the bees like, uh, porting the pollinates might, might lead quite a big issue with uh, further distributing the neophytes. So she loads this layer and checks and um, plays around a bit with the style and the brightness, makes it a bit darker and uh, tries to find some good way uh, to show it with some transparency too. And let's see, so there is actually not too much here, so that's, that's quite okay. Um, from this perspective, uh, it would be much worse in, in, in other parts, but um, actually right here in Switzerland, uh, in, in Ticino, near La Vertezzo, that shouldn't be much of an issue. So um, she also wants to check for, uh, for traffic, heavy traffic, and to, um, to do that, she goods traffic by road, <laughs> that's it. So she also checks if there is a lot of traffic, um, this is the red line here. Let's see if we zoom out a bit. We can see that um, in other parts there is much, much thicker lines. So that should also be quite okay and quite quiet actually here. Not too much heavy goods moving around. Perfect then. Um, the next thing she also check if there is a nature preserve area to see if that could be something that could affect her. Um, there is one small one there, but that's uh, quite far away, so that shouldn't be an issue as well. So from this perspective and doing some basic analysis, um, she decides that it's quite a good plan to start here with growing the bees and moves on. So, um, full of enthusiasm, Maya starts with her project and directly goes and adds her first layers. So, she adds uh, a new geo package layer and chooses a database name for that, or a file name rather for it. And um, see, she thinks what she could call it. Maybe data01 would be a very good and uh, self explanatory name. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> what could we do else? Um, so let's at least give the table name the name Beehive, and it's going to be some points that we're going to add there. And she also wants to have some fields uh, besides just a simple geometry field, um, like for example, what kind of bee species there are in this particular beehive. Um, Maybe what time she last visited it, the review date for uh, this beehive. Next thing would be the, um, if there is actually something in there. Some of them are, uh, are empty and not populated. So that's going to be a Boolean value, simple true, false. And she also wants to know like the average harvest. I guess that's in kilogram. Um, <coughs> I hope she added some metadata next to it where all of that is explained too, uh, which is an integer field. Super cool. Now we've got our um, first tables ready, so let's see what we can do with that. Um, so see, she starts and adds a new feature, a new beehive directly in front of her house. So she puts it there. Um, we can see that uh, QG is already uh, magically chose some uh, nice widgets on the attribute form. Uh, it's already, um, well, that there is a text field that's not very surprising, but the, the review date is already a calendar widget without any configuration, just because the geo package she created has um, a date field for this, uh, for this attribute. There's a Boolean if it's populated, she directly populates, she, she puts some bees in there of type Apis mellifera mellifera, which is the European uh, honeybee, I think. And um, now she wants to add some more and she uses the duplicate feature with digitizing geometry for that. What that does is it just copies the, all the attributes of the geometry while directly letting you put a new position for this feature. So now she has 
two copies um, of it, uh, three actually, <laughs> um, of uh, her beehives. And um, they're all there. Uh, she checks the attribute table, so there is a some feel, uh, some new features there. Uh, QGIS automatically copied all the data, but the f uh, feature ID, which is unique, was recreated um, in the background without her uh, doing a lot. So she's quite happy how that works. Um, so she wants to use um, which kind of plants are actually visited by her bees. She calls Matteo, who is um, a biologist, working uh, close by, and he sends her a geo package with all the base data on what uh, plants are there around. Maya now opens the data source manager and adds these new geo packages which she received from Matteo. She adds a new connection to this um, bot botanical data that she received. Uh, let's see what's in there. Connect to this new file, to this new database. There is one table, one layer called area. Looks interesting, uh, topologically correct. Maybe some holes in there, but apart from that, all good. Um, and it is in the file data, botanical data. Whereas um, we still have the data one geo package for her original data, and she doesn't really like this kind of, um, let's call it the shape wa shapefile way of thinking, of having one file per layer. Um, so she wants to combine those different data sets into a single one. And she uh, uses a processing algorithm to package layers, where she can select the two layers that she has, and create a new geo package file, uh, not a temporary file actually, but uh, we want to save it to a real file. And we call that one with a very intuitive name of data02.geopackage. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Now she runs the algorithm. She has all everything in one single place. And she's happy that she's able, she was able to manage that. Um, yeah, now we also add the layers from this new um, geo package onto our map canvas and remove the old one. And there we have it. It's all there. Perfect. All in uh, data 02, the geo package as we wanted it. And the original files can be deleted as we now have all the data copied into these new files, uh, into this new one single file. Here we are uh, looking at the botanical data that she received from Matteo and her beehives. But uh, so far it's quite um, hard to see what actually there is in this uh, botanical data right, that she received. So she starts to configure this with a, a different kind of symbology. She uses a categorized renderer uh, by plant species and clicks classify which automatically just shows all the different types of botanical fields that there are around all the areas. Um, so let's see, there is uh, some grassland there. There is a dandelions somewhere. Some fir trees. That's nice. I think that's uh, really pretty quite interesting for honey actually. I think that's uh, some good honey there. And chestnut, well actually chestnut, that's going to be some really good honey. That's uh, a lot of people like that, including me and I think Maya as well. So that's going to be, that's going to be really cool to have some chestnut honey and some fur honey there.
Um, now Maya installed some further um, beehives somewhere away in the forest to actually benefit from these new um, from these new types of uh, plants that she discovered around, and she goes there with a GPS device and assembles some uh, GPX data out there. Okay, once um, she obviously used her old device and um, that she found somewhere in the basement, and but still the device had this super cool option to, to delivering GPX files. Now she, she, does, she does need a way to elaborate on this data and so that's when uh, she starts up the, um, the modeler, the QGIS modeler. She goes on into the processing toolbox and starts creating a new model that, um, that will allow her to, to take the GPX file in and um, to convert it into something that she can then use by um, already separating the points um, into some good locations for, um, for beehives. And then while she was out walking, actually, Maya thought, well, look, this place looks really beautiful. Maybe in the future I'll also have um, people going around and uh, just walking around in the woods. So she's already thinking about expanding, not expanding her business, but about diversification in her business. So she had actually marked uh, some... Um, some fields as potential for be a hive and some other fields for potential places that that look uh, that look uh, really nice so like romantic trees for example <laughs> <laughs> well she my eyes uh, she went back to her childhood place so a lot of memory came back and that's why she she loves going around in the woods a lot and then also some meadows because um, that's nice spaces that eventually could hold a more um, more, um, more, uh, more, uh, more beehives. Yeah. She uses the refactor field um, processing algorithm to recalculate and get the the data out of uh, of uh, of a layer, and to load it into another table by deleting all the attribute that she doesn't need. The GPX file can be pretty verbose at times, depending on what device is generating it. So. Um, it's uh, it's uh, really important to. She wants to clean it up. She just needs whatever whatever is relevant to her. Now, once uh, she's happy with the model, um, she can store this, give it a name, GPX to QGIS, um, put whatever group it is in, and it it gets saved in the current project. And um, she can now run it with her GPX data by going to the processing toolbox and uh, she will get some layers in and she'll be able to, to go on to her, um, to, her next, to her next step. So here is where how she chooses the GPX file, um, runs it, an event and we will get a new layer. You see here all the layers. We get obviously also the point of interest and the romantic trees and the meadows, which are just for the future. So we, we're not gonna use them yet. That's why we're gonna, Maya's gonna turn them off and, uh, and keep on working. She copies all the interesting um, points from the generated memory layer you recognize it from the symbol. She copies and pastes them in her original data, well, in the geo package that she created before, so that she can keep on going with a consistent data set. And there she has her all new data imported and uh, stored in her geo package, so everything nice and clean together. She's obviously super stoked, uh, she's very happy. And um, her chestnut honey, for, if you don't know the southern part of Switzerland, uh, it has very beautiful um, uh, chestnut uh, forests. It is where uh, 
the chestnut honey is the typical honey from there is very beloved in the area people do like it a lot and they start asking Maya to produce more so she decides to put more beehives but she doesn't want to have uh, too much of a single type of bees so she wants to introduce a bit of diversity and that's why she decides to um, to increase uh, to introduce two new species the carning bee and the buckfast bee And from now on, obviously, everything gets a bit more complex because she needs to track more things. That's when she starts playing a bit more with labeling and styling. Here, she will have uh, multiple honey, um, multiple hives where where she needs to keep track of and uh, that she needs to to know directly what's in there. So she starts off by um, by setting up, obviously, labeling. Uh, first thing she does is, uh, well, show the ID of the of the beehive and show what type of um, what type of bee is she planted in that beehive so she she can control all that and then thanks to um, easy labeling she can move around the label so that everything is a bit uh, nicely placed everywhere around so everything gets more readable and um, it's clearer what is where obviously um, this makes it possible um, to, to read things like beehives. If you know how beehives are, usually they are very close to each other in a small room, in a small place, and then there is more space. So here she's, uh, she's using all the feature of easy labeling where she can rotate the, um, the labels, she can move them around so that they really look good in her map, and she can read uh, really nicely and have a very quick overview of... Um, of how things are. Then she goes on and says, well, nice, uh, okay, I can read, but I want to make it even more readable. Let's, let's create a buffer around our labels. Uh, buffer is one of the techniques that gives you uh, very much improved readability. Um, obviously, uh, the easiest way to buffer is just to put a white buffer around it. It is okay, but there are much nicer way to do that. And uh, it's when you do tone in tone, you just do a lighter tone, based on what you're doing in the back. So you can, um, you can increase readability by not being so harsh, just by having a white, white background around, um, around the text, which is black. So um, Maya's pretty happy with that. So she can, can live with, um, with that kind of labeling. Um, but then she decides um, to actually increase a bit more in the, um, the kind of labeling she wants and um, well she wants to connect the name to the label and that is why she starts to to play around with geometry generators geometry generators are an extremely powerful uh, tool in QGIS that allow you to generate geometries out of other geometries so here what she's doing is basically just taking a point x and y <coughs> and uh, another point, which is auxiliary storage labeling position X, which is the basically the position of where she puts the label. And out of those two points, she makes a line. So by making a line out of this, we automatically get to see the original point plus the line that connects the point to the label. And we're going to see um, that we can improve, increase a lot our, on it. And that's exactly what Maya decides to do. She decides to, to go and edit the um, expression. First of all, she wants the line to land exactly in the middle, at, at the top, so not at the bottom left. So we can all, all set these kind of things. And, um, and then she decides, obviously, to make it look uh, nice. And that's when she starts playing around with things. And somehow she finds the cat rail. Uh, but she decides that's not really appropriate with what for what what she wants to do, so she just goes with a more kind of relaxed thing with like a, a nice and, and um, a dash pattern, um, black dash pattern, and she's she's pretty happy with it. But um, obviously she keeps on seeing more and more potential, and um, she decided then, well, okay, now uh, I'd like to actually see um, what kind of um, what kind of uh, beehive is bringing me how much honey to home? Um, earlier on, Maya had defined two QGIS variables, Maya house X and Maya house Y. 
um, and these are the coordinates to her house so that she doesn't need to remember that she lived at 622, 247 and uh, the other coordinate, but she can just reuse everywhere in her code. She can just say make point Maya house X Maya is Y and she can have the, the lines going from the point to her home. She can even go further and say, well, it gets really crowded around my house, so I'm going to make a buffer around it and, and make it cleaner so that uh, actually the house is not full on filled with lines landing on top of it. Here we see the, her, uh, her final, final solution where she is, uh, is happy with. And eventually she say, well, uh, let's try one more little detail. The lines here in the middle get really uh, stuck over each other. We, we should have some space, maybe curve them. So she, she thinks about solution. How could she do that? Well, maybe by putting a, a point in the middle, I can add points to, to a line. Uh, she tries out, but turns out um, mm, doesn't really work the way she wants. So she thinks, oh, well, Let's uh, let's keep on, on focusing on the on the on the on the main task here, which is just uh, you know just like uh, having um, me the lines showing how much honey is coming from each beehive, and here Maya does uh, make um, uh, the line width scaled based on the production of honey from each beehive. Using the average harvest, uh, she scales it linearly and decides on some parameters to have it uh, a bit more wide or uh, or narrow. And suddenly, she can see directly that this beehive and this beehive are the ones that are bringing more into her um, into her productions. So maybe she can go there and analyze why does this beehive really work well and why do other beehives work less well. Okay, then um, Maya suddenly has a lot of beehives already around and um, she starts thinking, well, how big is the area I'm working on? So she, she just quickly draws a memory layer with a polygon around a rough, uh, rough edges around whatever uh, she's working on and then um, finds on the internet an, a style by some uh, engineer that said, well, this is a style you can reuse uh, and uh, it has dimensions for polygons and she just goes and try it out and she tries to load it and suddenly she has technical drawings of her polygon uh, with distances, uh, uh, areas, uh, all edges are measured so she's super happy she knows now that she's dealing with this kind of area but uh, obviously the other problem she has is that uh, because she has slowly more and more um, beehives is that points are getting really crowded. So she thinks, well, maybe some clustering could be a solution. So uh, she goes on and, um, and starts changing the signs. First of all, she, she decides she wants to make a nicer, um, a nicer looking beehives, not just a red dot, that's boring. Um, she wants a little, a nice SVG marker that looks like a beehive, so she goes on the internet, looks for it, and finds a beehive. She's not that much into graphic design, she loves GIS, and uh, she's a bit of a geek, a bit of a de software developer, so graphic design definitely not hurts. But she does like things that look uh, good, so she decides, well, here's my little beehive with a bee on top of it, and then she wants it um, to be obviously, um, as I said before, clustered, so because the sign now is even bigger, so it's getting even more crowded. And now Maya can, uh, by, by using the cluster renderer, can um, suddenly have two different types of, of, um, of rendering. One for when you're zoomed out, and there are a lot of, peop of points there, and they get just clustered together with a number on of how many beehives actually are behind it, and then how many beehives are there when you're zooming in, they actually get rendered one by one and here you see we are zoomed in enough and as soon as we zoom out they they get clustered but then she realized oh i didn't configure it quite well because uh, it clusters too late my symbol is pretty big so i need to cluster a bit earlier and here she's like oh yeah that looks nice as soon as uh, 
as soon as I'm zooming in a little bit, I have here one cluster and uh, the other ones are already unclustered. So she's uh, pretty happy with this. The last thing that she wants to do, it's uh, obviously she now lost the categorization. She doesn't know anymore graphically directly uh, what kind of bees I'm dealing with when I'm zoomed in. So she starts, um, she goes and changes the renderer and applies categorization to the unclustered um, uh, representation. So here she can zoom out and um, after zooming out she has a clustering and when she zooms in she actually gets the categorical uh, information. And you see here, uh, we saw just before, the colors also are applied to the SVG so it's pretty, pretty interesting way to, um, to, to display things. Um, Maya is, is super happy, obviously. It has been a very intense summer. She's been producing a lot of honey, a lot of works, building up GIS, building on hives. She's been talking to her friends to help her out, carry the hives up. Finally, the winter is here. She can enjoy some, uh, some tea. She, she has had a lot of success selling her, um, her uh, or honey. And, um, well, uh, as season go on, life goes on, and uh, in the spring, uh, there's a disaster. Uh, Maya goes out to visit, obviously she goes out regularly, and before the beginning of the actual season, when you, you do need to, to take care, start, um, start changing the type of care that you, you have for the bees in the winter, you need to nourish them, and later on you change into a bit more of production mode, and she finds out that uh, some beehives have been infested by the infamous Varroa destructor, which is um, 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 a little bug that actually does pretty nasty things to bees. Uh, that's really what uh, you do not want to have. Um, and we know you, yeah, that's why. <laughs> and Matthias will tell you the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so she immediately decides that um, she must uh, she must check what is going on there and uh, what is the status of her um, of her uh, beep of the whole production. So. Um, uh, she now uh, she already added some additional fields there, and she starts to configure the attribute form to be ready for the checking of all the beehives and the status to see how severe it is what what all happened to her. So um, there is a new field which is called infected, which is a boolean field um, with a checkbox, and there is a new group disease, and we can see in here that in this uh, there, there is a in the group disease it, an expression set and if this is set that it actually only shows the disease type if infected is actually activated there is also a drop down list ah here we are back to the um, visibility fumigation is also only shown when infected is activated she makes it also a bit nicer to look at. She likes capitalization, so she puts a different name to the field alias. And she w wants to know who actually did the check of uh, this location. She cannot do it all by her own, so she orders some friends. And um, she does um, a, se she has a separate table with all her friends, and she always wants to have a value in there. That's why she activates the uh, not null constraints. So with every check, someone has to set who actually did this, did perform the check on the field. She also wants to know when the check has been done. And for that, she adds a default value now for an initial field review date. And whenever it's going to have changes on this fe feature, they will be applied automatically. So whenever you change the feature, she changes the feature, the last date of the last modification will be inside the review date field. So let's have a look at what this looks like. Um, there is, she has been using also the drag and drop designer to order the fields in uh, some tabs. We can see that there is uh, an orange X showing um, if a, a value is in there and only once it's okay in the green tick um, and she assigned a reviewer. She's able to accept the feature form and say that it has been checked. If she activates infected, only then the additional uh, information will appear on the feature form to show if um, they are dead, uh, if they need to be smoked out, fumigated, or um, 
uh, all this additional information that she has there. To perform these checks, she's <laughs> she's really <laughs> not. <laughs> Um, she really cannot do it, do it all on her own, so she invites her friends Matteo, who we have already seen, and Sophie, another friend of hers, to help her out there. To do that, um, out in the field, they use the mobile application QField and uh, take their QGIS project out there. Matteo and Sophie, they do the best to check all of it. What we see here is uh, Matteo's tablet. Um, where he goes out and um, checks the beehives on site. Um, so there are some which are okay and some which are infected, which we can see on the color of the beehives. And if we open up one of them, um, we see that the date is automatically also um, uh, respected and all the configuration of only showing this disease type uh, based on infected status, um, who the reviewer is, the list there, and uh, that it's only okay if the reviewer has actually been added, then, um, and only then uh, uh, it is okay. So there's quite a lot of uh, configuration which is directly taken from the QGIS configuration into QField. And um, they go along and go and check all the different beehives and um, actually quite a couple of them are infected. Matteo also went to this one, same date, not infected, lucky us. This one is actually infected as well with the European fowl breed. He says that it was Matteo who did it. She has learned a lesson for next time uh, that she doesn't want to click on her own name every time she goes somewhere and that she could actually configure it on the tablet with a variable that uh, depending on which tablet you enter this new data, the different uh, persons who did it are also taken into account. Matteo, while out there, uh, you remember that he was the guy who originally delivered the, the botanical data. He realizes that he was not actually accurate at some place. Uh, some place. So he uses the uh, geometry editing functionalities of QField to just correct his data um, to be more accurate. And as you can see, he's also uh, taking the, the snapping configuration of the project into account. Maya, on the other hand, is not really happy now because there is quite a bit of um, infected plants out there. Um, so. She wants to analyze a bit further the whole status of it. She goes to the attribute table. Uh, we can see that she already transferred back all the data, the reviewer, if it's infected, the kind of the disease and so on. Uh, there is some American fowl breed here, some Varroa destructors there. Um, quite a couple of different things. She wants to have the attribute table next to her map, so she puts it into a docket widget. And um, yeah, just by scrolling through it, she realizes that that's not gonna help forever for everything. So she thinks, why not add a couple of colors to this attribute table to see a bit more visually, uh, not only on the map, but also on the, on the attribute table inside the table, how that is. So she enters a new, um, condition in there which is infected uh, um, infected equal to true and if infected is equal to true then um, she will just uh, make it a bit in a different color semi-transparent one um, yeah italics too and once she activates that she can see that um, directly in the attribute table the affected places are highlighted um, in in um, pink, some sort of uh, semi-transparent pink. She also wants to see what kind of disease there is because they're actually not all of them um, very uh, serious to the same level. So she has also a condition on the value of the current field 
Um, if that one is infected by the Varroa destructor, it's going to be styled differently than when it is the, um, infected by the American fowl breed or the European fowl breed. So if the value is um, Varroa and the um, and infected is true, then she will mark it in red and add also an icon to that. She's a kind of a graphical person, having worked in GIS she and, and cartography for a while, she appreciates some good looking things. So she thinks, why not add some scary looking um, additional icon there? Okay, so there's quite a bit of the Varroa destructor around. And uh, only if it's Varroa destructor and infected is true, she will actually mark it to not have any, unfor uh, any leftovers where uh, people uh, deactivated, uh, infected again after having it set to Varroa destructor. So she also does a second um, rule on the foul breeds. The check is similar to the first one. So either it is a American foul breed or the uh, European version of it. Whoever spots a typo in here, please hold up your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and also only if you've infected is true. So let's see if that works despite the typo. Uh-huh, bold, italic, done. Ah, uh, not actually. Now, there we go. The second typo, we forget about that one. <laughs> Okay, so after having it analyzed, she sees that um, the American fowl breed is actually not that bad, but the Varroa destructor is really serious. She's quite unhappy, because what that means is that all these beehives will need to be fumigated, and uh, actually that means killing the bees. And um, so, um, yeah, because they cannot be only done in reality, but also must be reflected properly in a GIS system. She defines that she's going to do it with some, uh, some uh, special symbology uh, to show how this fumigation went on. So she creates a special effect for that. She transforms it into a rule-based renderer, and that's a new SVG marker uh, of some flames in red. And she edits the size of it and makes it a, um, a um, data-dependent symbology with an expression based on the seconds uh, from of now, modulo 5, divided by 5 to define the size of it. Um, and adds, edits some additional properties of it. And that uh, in the rendering section, she uh, enables um, a live layer, so the layer should be refreshed automatically, redrawn every second. Uh, now that we have defined this style, there is not much to see yet, because everywhere um, the, the dead field that you see totally on the right is still set to false, so she didn't perform yet the fumigation, but no worries, that's soon gonna happen. So whenever um, infected is true, and the type of disease is the infamous Varroa destructor. We uh, select the feature. So there we go. Plenty of uh, Varroa destructors around. She goes to edit mode enters multi-edit mode, the multi-edit mode just will um, apply whatever she changes in this form here to all the selected features. And she puts them to dead, meaning she will fumigate them. And there we go. It's actually quite a bit of all her honeybees that um, had to go for good this time. She looks at it, not necessarily very 
with a lot of uh, good humor. Quite sad to see all of that. Some here, some here. Pretty much everywhere she had to go and eliminate her beehives. <laughs> Sad thing, Maya, poor. <laughs> However, she decides that that's not the end of the days. She looks ahead, she gets herself together, she decides the very first thing she needs to do is to get rid of this awful effect that she just created. The bees are gone. <laughs> anyway, let's turn it just off. And she looks into the future. She tags them as empty beehives with the potential to create something new together with the bees. She also um, dis uh, destroyed the destructor. And there it is, ready. Now, Maya recently learned about some uh, different kind of certification which is available, which are uh, alpine products and mountain products. So she loads some additional layers for, uh, to show where in Switzerland, if you grow something, that it's uh, an alpine or possible to label it and certify it as an alpine product and where it's possible to tag it as a mountain product. She thinks that it might be a good idea to look into these uh, possibilities to sell her honey as mountain product or, um, or alpine product. So she adds these two layers, which uh, she, by the way, also found with uh, the, the Swiss Locator plugin, which uh, queries uh, this, the GeoAdmin um, data portal. I think uh, similar plugins also exist for other countries. I've heard about Denmark, and I think there are others too. And um, so to look at that, she adds to the legend an opacity slider, because right now there's really not much she can see on her map. And with this opacity slider, it's possible to control directly from the legend tree the visibility and the opacity or transparency um, of each layer individually quite quickly for a quick comparison. So she changes the opacity of the mountain products layer. We can see something there. Uh, the alpine product is layer is still fully intransparent, but we can already see that actually all her beehives qualify for mountain products but none of them none of them qualifies as an alpine product but who knows maybe that comes later and maybe she can also add some more there Maya, it's, uh, it's obviously happy. It has been a very tough spr uh, spring, so burning hives, burning bees, and then uh, then uh, rethinking about what, what's going to come and, um, and um, what she can do. And um, usually in Switzerland, we say to people, here is the moment where we take a short break, but since here we have only um, an hour and a half, you'll have to stick with us and just do yoga while sitting or um, do yoga while standing. So just, um, yeah, a bit short time, so we keep on going. Um, yeah, uh, Maya's gotten uh, very good feedbacks, especially from the, um, from the honey, because she's tracking everything. So she really knows where her honeys come from. So she got very good feedback from honey that actually is produced near uh, lavender fields. Uh, it gives a bit of a sweetish taste to the a bit uh, more bitter taste of the chestnuts. So it's a, it's a really pleasant combination. And that's why she wants to see, okay, exactly which, which beehives are actually producing this very specific type of honey, which I'll obviously maybe, uh, she can market as chestnut lavender honey or, or something like that. She's very entrepreneurial, so she, she does like uh, 
Hai fermato il video. Um, so she starts by doing the easiest thing that she can uh, is uh, just putting a label to the um, to the fields and so she can do some uh, visual inspection um, that is um, that is obviously one uh, one way to do the other way to do it is by setting up an uh, multi uh, many to many relation tables where she can then say okay these uh, these beehives are going to that field mainly and uh, we will see we will see eventually she comes up with a very pretty solution that generates graphs about where each beehive actually goes and feeds on so first thing she does um up um basic and now we can go to the to the next uh here she starts setting up um the whole uh, many to many relations um tuk -tuk. I was a bit too fast talking because of the break. Do some yoga. Do some <laughs> <yoga>. <laughs> I need to wait for it. Um, she goes around a bit in the in her fields. Look, okay, here we have fur, here we have lavender. Uh, create. Uh, she creates an association table um, where she then can see. Okay, the beehive one goes to area one. Roughly 40% of the the bees go there. So obviously this percentage is is set by her expertise. Uh, meanwhile, she she knows how to deal with bees. So she knows more or less uh, they go that often there, that often there. So that's when when she sets up the percentage um, between the the various uh, hives and fields, and then. Um, she goes to the locator and search for um, relations. So relations are ways in QGIS to, to tell or to tell QGIS that some layers are um, connected to each other. So here she can set up um, automatically discover relations and she can set up um, uh, dependencies between the areas um, with the area ID and uh, beehives and so on. So here she tells QGIS basically these tables are dependent between each other. Obviously, she can choose between composition and association. Association means that um, if we delete a beehive or we burn a beehive that was reviewed by Matteo, we're not going to delete Matteo. So we let him leave. It's okay. He did his job, but, uh, but it's all right. On the other hand, if, um, if you're using composition, uh, if we would delete a field for some reason, uh, the, the bees cannot feed on that field anymore. That's what composition is. Um, she's happy with all the background work that she needed to do. Uh, she now can go to the cool things, to the, she can hack a bit around. And she discovers that, um, oh, no, sorry. First, she still needs to set, to check that, uh, to set the cardinality is many to one or and to the area. So it's actually already done automatically, but she wants to be sure that, uh, that everything is set correctly. And um, now she can go to the information tool and she'll see that uh, whenever she opens the form under the bee foods, she sees actually every single field where the bees are feeding. So um, the, this specific uh, beehive that she chooses uh, feeds on four different fields, some are lavender. Um, she can then click on it and she can go and check uh, very quickly by clicking. Um, she sees on QGIS where that field is and then she says, well, okay, yeah, this one with this one makes sense. She, it's can, she can do some quality assurance from her data, visual quality assurancing if she suddenly had this uh, beehive feeding on a super far um, field, maybe she did typing mistake or something. So she's very happy with this and looking forward to uh, a bit more hacking. So she discovers um, that um, QGIS has a new widget and that new widget um, allows her to, um, to actually code QML. QML is a fairly simple uh, programming language that allows her to create some interactivity. And the first thing that she wants to do, it's actually just um, displaying a picture of the field. So instead of just saying it's a lavender field, actually she wants to see how that field looks like. Uh, 
earlier on when she digitized the data, she, um, she had uh, taken pictures as well, obviously, of the fields. So she already has the data in, the, um, in her database, in her geo package. Uh, she already has the link to the picture. She has the pictures. Um, and what she now needs to do is uh, creating um, some QML code. She, she never did QML before, so she uses one of the pre-made templates that are here available here, so a rectangle. And then she just needs to say, well, uh, it's a rectangle, that size, that height, and it will include an image, and the, the field mode should preserve the aspect. So we do not want the photos to change ratio. If a photo is white, it will stay white, and, and so on. And then she sets the, um, the path to uh, the relative path, um, I mean the absolute path in this case, and then with um, an expression evaluate, she can insert data, uh, she can ins insert QGIS expressions. So here she actually goes and read the picture attribute from the attribute table, from the uh, data, and um, she has the widget, and here you see she renames it, but you already see on the right side an example that she will be, she will be seeing how, how it will look like. So whenever now she's opening the, um, the feature form, we automatically have um, an image there. So pretty handy, she's, she's pretty happy already, so every time she changes field, she, uh, she, already, sees, um, she already sees how the field looks like. Now, the very cool thing is obviously when she goes to the um, when she goes to the um, beehive and she clicks on the fields that the bee feed on, the image is also updated. So it's, it's very interactive. So she's starting getting some interaction here. Um, for her, that's just the, the first step. Showing a picture is just the, the basic, the initial step. She obviously wants to do more. She originally started off with the task of uh, showing um, where, where, where bees feed on. And that's when she decides that she wants to show actually a pie chart with percentages of, uh, of how much on, on which field every bee is going from each beehive. And for this also there is already a pre-made pie chart code where um, it's a little bit more complex than, uh, than the one that she did before, but she meanwhile has been playing around with QML a little bit. And um, so she, she kind of can hack her way around and uh, the syntax is not that complex, so she creates some slides. Look on them. Okay, sorry. Um, she creates some slide and she she noticed that uh, this code is going to be in the post, so uh, you can read all the code. But basically, she creates pie series with pie slice, and um, and currently there is only one slice. But uh, she can then add interactivity with on click, and uh, whenever there is a click, she decides she appends. Uh, a pi slide to the pi series, and now suddenly she has interactivity with uh, with four four blocks, which are coming from an array that she defined uh, that was defined predefined, and now well that array needs to be filled from um, from the data. So she cannot do it statically; it's obviously boring. Um, we want to get. Uh, information out of the data, and that's where we can use the relation aggregate um, expression in QGIS by telling, well, it's bees on array aggregate, and here we can say what fields we are taking, and we see that we are getting kind of a format that we were expecting, and um, and she tries it out, uh, adds it, and when she clicks, suddenly we are getting a dynamic chart generated on the percentages that are coming from my many-to-many uh, -many relationship. So she's she's happy, but uh, not quite all she wanted. She, she's you know she's been spending her life doing this kind of things, and she really likes playing with QGIS. So she decides that uh, that's cool, but she wants actually that when she overs. Uh, one of these uh, this pie slices, she sees the picture of the field. So that's when she's gonna go, she goes back and gets uh, whatever she did before um, and combines the two things together. So um, she takes the image, uh, she adds it to the code, and, 
whenever she overs now, she puts the code in the on uh, on over, uh, and here she has all visi all visible. We were in the preview mode here, and now she's obviously going to test it out um, on the field and uh, on the field. I mean on the on on her beehives. And when she clicks on a beehive, open the feature form, she goes to the bee food, suddenly she has this beautiful graph, which by just moving around, will see the picture of the fields. So that's, um, now she's really, really happy. She thinks, uh, well, coding that I learned back at the university time hasn't changed that much. So, so um, she's really happy. She has uh, the, the title, the name of uh, the type of, uh, of um, whatever it was, and with the percentage and so on. So, so she's she's very very happy. Also interesting, she has that uh, she added how many which um, which field it w the ID of the field as well. So she can use multiple uh, multiple information there. Now she goes to check another one and she sees here, okay, here we have this the wonderful combination and chestnut and lavender. So this is a beehive she really likes a lot. She's gonna maybe take a little bit of extra care with that beehive, make sure the Novaroa comes there. Um, but yeah, all in all, she's uh, very, very happy with, um, with what she, she managed to do so far. Now, I mentioned she's very happy with that one beehive that has this magic combination. Um, this is a garden in La Vertezzo. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing place, it's a really beautiful uh, town. Um, as you can see from the houses, it's a typical town from the southern part of Switzerland. Um, and um, obviously Maya thinks, well, uh, I know a lot about my bees, but La Vertezzo has so many little, there are so many little gardens, you never know where lavender actually is. Lavender just grows in small bushes, so it grows a bit here and there. And then she thinks, well, okay, how do I get that information? Obviously, uh, information is hidden in people that live there since long time, so she decides to start a campaign and go out and speak to people and ask them about their own uh, village and uh, and she obviously grew up there as a kid, so they're all super happy that she's there now, and uh, they'll help her digitize a lot of information. So uh, all the old people from the town, they agree that they will help her. Uh, there's just one issue. They're uh, not very used to computers, but um, they will just they just promised to provide her with hand drawings of what there is around and let her do the job herself. So um, to do that, she uses um, some functionality in QGIS to um, add and edit geometries. So as a first thing, she enables the snapping toolbar because there is gonna be some fields and some gardens which are just adjacent to each other. So that's where we want to snap. And she sets the snapping and she also um, enables tracing there or not. Um, and then she starts drawing and uh, it actually snaps to all the pre-existing geometries there and by with the tracing that she did activate um it she it automatically follows the existing borders of the of this area so she doesn't necessarily need to click and click and click and click to follow it she just can can just draw one line and it would will be filled automatically um so that's here some weed uh which is owned on national level <coughs> she continues to draw and uh, adds and enables an ad ad another um, panel which is the advanced digitizing panel and she enables advanced digitizing this advanced digitizing allows her to draw rectangles or um, or, um right angles easily that automatically snaps 
to to these angles you are it's also possible to define different angles that you want to snap to and always just um, use the, a line with the last drawn line and that allows her to draw easily along those um, pre-existing underlying um, shapes of the 2.5D background map and um, she fills it here and there with all kinds of different um, of different plants and whatever there was she also looks into more advanced um, digitizing things uh, one of the toolbars that is available there is for drawing shapes so it's also possible to draw different kinds of shapes for example rectangular areas which she adds here so you can just um, draw one line and then expand it and that's quite easy to do um, squares or rectangles this way and just quickly added some more fields rectangular fields there Now, she doesn't on only need the rectangular fields, she also adds some circular ones. These are actually the rice fields there, which uh, are watered. So the watering um, tool they use, it just goes around. So that, that's kind of why they, why they do these fields in a circle. That's, uh, I think, always the point where uh, the people who live there start to laugh, because they know very well that there is not going to grow any rice there. <laughs> And now um, she uses those advanced digitizing tools that she used once in her job um, to create parallel lines to uh, other existing lines. So she, she selects one line and we see that there is a helper line appearing parallel to the previous one and she can follow that one. And she can also directly enter a distance. Um, where to go, she can produce intermediate points which are not actually digitized and just are like uh, to help her to go um, three meters into this direction, then five meters in another direction and then two meters back up and um, this way allowing to, to um, create very complex constructs and uh, geometric based on some geometric conditions, so another rectangular um, parallel line there. Uh, she enables the, the construction tools again because she needs an intermediate point and then she enters a distance of, let's see, 50, uh, five, 5 meters. So 5 meters distance from there but parallel to the other line she adds an additional point. Um, actually, she after uh, she she did it here by with clicking uh, with the mouse always over there. But it's very well possible to do all of that if you do heavy digitizing with just pressing D and A and X and Y, which will as soon as you hit the, one of the one of the characters bring you to these fields to enter numerically some distances, some angles, or directly the coordinates where you want to want to. Um, at your next point or your next construction point. And finally, she also found that there are some topological issues there. Um, and she needs to edit some existing features, so she adds a new point um, which lies um, on another line. So she snaps, uh, she uses uh, just the, the point that, is in, uh, that appears automatically in the center of a segment as soon as you hover over it to add additional points and snaps them to pre-existing ones. 
she uh, now also needs to um, move to this this um, node there, but she obviously wants to move both nodes, so she can just select both of them and move them wherever she needs them to have them properly aligned with each other and having a topologically correct data set in the end. After all this <laughs> tough job of digitizing, she's quite happy that she's completely covered whole Avertezzo with the information that was delivered by all the local people. And she decides to move on and yeah, let's see what there is. There is plenty of uh, wheat and dalliance, grassland, barley, many different um, things that she can now also use to properly label her honey. Now, she reminds herself that there was this mountain products, right? But there's also the alpine product, which gives quite a bit of money too. So she decides that she wants to start working more on the alpine products and she thinks back about these beautiful places up there where she used to go when she was young. All these lovely fields up there where you have a nice view onto the lake and over the mountains, the surrounding mountains between the goats and to go there and put some additional beehives. So next thing she does is she wanders back up there to the mountains and places additional beehives in some spots up there which are called um, Corte Nuovo, Cor Cornavosa and Fimenia. Um, she brings back in the alpine products layer to check if it's really all in the alpine area and she realizes that these three spots might be quite good possibilities to expand her business and um, create now officially labeled alpine honey. Um, she also wants to have the roots up there properly uh, shown. So while she was walk walking up there, she took a GPS along the road and walked up there. And now she shows these GPS tracks to, um, to go up there. It's quite a long walk actually. But even though she's retired, she's still in good condition and she enjoys it uh, to go up there. It's also quite nice, uh, fresh alpine air, not only for her, but also for her bees. And but now she realizes that she always has to switch between all these different locations which are so far apart from each other and that quite often when she's zooming in and out and panning she just misses these positions. So she thinks it might be a good point in time to introduce some spatial bookmarks to quickly switch between the locations. And she tags first her local house um, with one of the bookmarks. We already know her house quite well which is down here. Now she goes up, back to Corte Nuovo, zooms in there to have a precise location. She adds a new bookmark for Corte Nuovo. And this way it will allow her to pretty quickly switch between all these different locations. Next thing is Fimenia. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Oh. <laughs> it's actually easier to pronounce than Nudebo. Uh, which we're supposed to say quite often because it was a huge release name. <laughs> and Cornavosa. Now she has all these bookmarks ready and she can switch between them, go from one to the other. Whenever she needs to check something, it's easily accessible by a quick double click on one of the names. She's obviously happy, she has her hives up, 
in the in the beautiful Swiss mountains. Um, but she quickly realizes that going every day and doing it's about a thousand two hundred meter aid gain to each of those Alps, so it would make three point six uh, so three thousand six hundred meter aid gain by to go to each of the Alps every day it's uh, it's a bit of a work so she she decides that she wants to actually uh, set up a super modern system which is uh, basically a 4g balance that she puts underneath the the beehives and it keeps on waiting the beehive so uh, obviously being 4g it transmits the the weight directly to her post GIS database and she builds up um, a pretty neat uh, visualization where she actually knows each of the beehives have a maximum have a maximum kind of uh, quantity that it can contain and then based on the weight she can calculate the percentage um, here she is refreshing every second so that you also can see the changement uh, bees are not producing one kilo per second that that would be very <laughs> very effective bees um, the way she does it is basically by um, um, here we are just she just used fake production for demonstration purposes but uh, this would be the weight that comes in from the the 4g uh, data and then uh, divides that by the maximum uh, allowed weight and then makes a percentages out of it, out of it and multiplies it a bit to uh, to make it accordingly to the jar size because the jar size does not change in the um, in the in the visualization so here you see the honey growing some are growing a bit faster 32 34 kilos so um pretty pretty interesting way for for her to um to 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 still being able to go up there at times jogging and uh when she goes up there jogging obviously that's when we get our best ideas and she thinks well i have um beehives in wonderful places I have GPS tracks to get up there. Um, I like moving and I have information about clients. Southern Switzerland is, is a very touristy area for most for, uh, for hiking as well. So why not, um, why not create routes that lead people from the town, down at the bottom, up to my beehives, teach them about bees, and, um, and obviously put there a little house where I can sell honey as well. So they'll have, they learn something, they've seen something beautiful, they moved around, they buy my honey, which is super healthy, so there's a, like a win-win-win-win-win situation. Um, how does she do that? Well, first of all, she decides that she wants to create um, signs. So she prepares um, her data, she's gonna take the beehives in, she's gonna take um, the roots, uh, the hiking routes, uh, which have just a bit of another style, and um, um, looks at it. She's going to check the feature forms. She puts some information about the hike, so um, uh, some descriptions um, that these hikes are good in summer. The one is very good in winter as well. The other one is a bit dangerous because of avalanche risk. So she's uh, she's she's preparing all the the um, informative text, all these um, all these these things that you want eventually to print on on nice wooden plank, and um, put some nice signs on the map. So a bit of of styling of the map, and then she goes to the layout manager. Here is where she can start preparing uh, whatever she will be printing. So. <coughs> Um, she's going to print a sign about the, the area where she is um, with some picture of the, that's the actual picture of up there, so it is really beautiful in case you go to southern Switzerland, it's really cool. Um, the nice text that she prepared and the track of the route. Um, she's going to change this the map so zoom out so she obviously wants to show people that southern switzerland is a place where you need to be a little bit fit when you want to go hiking if you don't want to stay across around the lake it goes pretty much from flat to vertical very very quickly um, so she wants to show people what the profile looks like and that there is uh, 
there is uh, some altitude gain to be to be taken. So she has generated the the profile with a profile tool that uh, will quickly sh she will show us later, and imported with an expression an image that she prepared at a certain spot. So she has a beautiful sign. And now, we, thanks to the Atlas functionality, she can move around from Corte Nuovo to Fimegna to um, um, Cornavosa, thank you. <laughs> um, she does a bit of minor adjustments uh, so that everything is aligned and then exports a PDF. When uh, she exports the PDF the, that she's gonna send to the printer, um, she checks it obviously first, and um, she realizes that she she made a, a small small mistake. Um, we're going to see the PDF first, which opened up in the other screen of Maya. <laughs> um, so she realized, well, Corte Nuovo, there is everything correct here. Yeah, that all looks good, but it's not nice that there is Fiumegna and Cornavosa as well there. So. She, she wants to take that away. Um, I mean, if you want to be doing things, then you might do them as well, right? So she goes back and um, puts a rule-based uh, symbology on where the filter is uh, using ID equal at Atlas feature, which basically means if it's the feature that is being generated by the Atlas right now, then show it. You see that it's yellow, and the other ones stay because of the of the roots layer, so the lower layer is there, but the actual dotted layer, um, so if people want to go to Corte Nuovo, they actually get shown that they are going to Corte Nuovo or to Cornavora or to Fimegna. <laughs> so um, she's happy now. Um, she tries printing again and um, Uh, she's super happy, she, she just does some minor adjustment, but uh, all in all, she's happy. She can close everything, she printed, she sends it to the printer, and um, she realizes that she forgot to mention how she produced, obviously, those, uh, uh, those, profile to those profiles, and uh, she wants to you to learn as well. So she goes back and shows you, well, I use the SRTM downloader plugin, which allows me uh, to, to just download uh, SRTM data. You do need a NASA login, which sounds like a super fancy thing to get, but you just go there and you register and you get a NASA login. And then you can just say, I need SRTM data for this area, which you can select set canvas extent, and you will automatically get the, the elevation data. Set them in the background, you don't need to show them. Um, you can also show them if, you, if you're interested in the topography. And then um, put, we were not interested in it, so we are just put them in the background. Uh, but w we are interested in them when using the terrain profile plugin. And in this plugin, we can just say, well, um, Maya goes and says, well, I add these two layers to it. Um, and then the plugin automatically can generate profiles for you, either by um, using a temporary polyline, which you digitize, or by selecting, we'll see now, we want the SVG because we want it to be um, high quality, and then here, we can say by selected polyline, and I can uh, Maya can now go and click on the on the polyline, and the profile gets generated automatically. And Maya can export it as an image with the ID of the um, of the work, and it can get it gets reused automatically by the atlas in the background. Puoi continuare. Super happy, she goes out, places her, her little um, signs, and then um, she goes to a friend that is working in marketing, and he tells her, yeah, well, nice, uh, you, put super, you put cool routes on, you put information on and everything, but nowadays people plan their vacation from home, so you do need to show things on the web. 
So that's when she starts Googling around and um, she finds uh, many different um, WebGIS tools, uh, QGIS, uh, that work with QGIS, and she, she finally decides um, that um, she chose one, she's gonna do that, she's gonna try one out. So she installs a plugin called Lismap, um, and from there she can configure what kind of layers she wants to show, and she asks her friends that has a hosting company to, to set, her, set her up with, uh, with the server part of it and give her a connection where she can just push the configurations. And um, pretty quickly after setting up what kind of layers she wants to show and uh, what interactivity do they need to have, she has a WebGIS up and running um, with um, uh, the possibility to choose which layer to show and here she has the same rendering um, of that she created in QGIS because everything is powered by QGIS server in the background. So um, she's super happy because it, uh, it took her a bit of work obviously to get here but now she has prints out, she has a website, she has honey production so she, she obviously is um, is very well set up to, to have people come to Ticino, come to southern Switzerland and have a, a, a full-on experience related to, to, her, um, to her honey. The, the cool thing is that when um, she, she read about Lismap and what you can do is she realized that QGIS server can also use HTML that is produced in QGIS itself to show information. So she can actually have people to click on the routes and uh, uh, show the same information that are in the print composer. It's Maya, it's, it's, it's stoked. <laughs> and uh, people uh, start, uh, up. there are rumors that, that uh, in the region, some people are getting a bit um, unhappy because she, she's getting a bit greedy and uh, um, she just think about money and there are rumors say that they start calling her the queen bee of La Vertezza. Well, always when things start to look too good to be true, they probably are not. <laughs> Maya, after being happy, her hears that in northern Italy there was a, a biological um, station and that some killer bees escaped from there and are flying around. So she thinks about what, what she could do. And um, so she, analyzed, she wants to analyze if they can actually affect her beehives. And she now realizes that um, there is some, uh, depending on if, they're, uh, if the slopes are north facing or south facing or depending on the altitude, that um, the killer bees might survive or not survive. So above 1,200 meters or uh, in the northern part, um, even a bit further down, they will not uh, be able to survive. So she starts modeling um, this um, behavior uh, or, or this probability of the bees actually affecting her beehives. For that, she creates a new model or actually she uh, will just show you here a pre-created one and so she does some analysis as an input layer she has the altitude layer um, there is a likelihood and likelihood index based on the altitude of, the, of each individual site so like uh, based on if it's uh, on 800, below 800 or be between 800 and 900 or between 900 and 1,200 uh, 1, meters above sea level, that's gonna make a uh, different index. So the lower it is, the higher the index, um, the, the higher the probability they're gonna be there. There is also another um, pipeline uh, besides where she calculates the aspect for uh, each raster point within the area and uh, where she does an analysis on the, on the aspect of, um, of this so, um, to know if it's north facing or south facing. And then um, these two indices, they are multiplied, which means that the, the final output is some kind of a likelihood that the killer bees are able to survive there. As an input for that, she takes um, an SRTM altitude image 
and runs the algorithm. It takes a little while, but not too long. It's actually quite fast until she sees how likely and where um, the killer bees may come to. So let's see if her nightmare comes true. Um, yet another opacity slider which we've met before to be able to overlay this. And looking at that, it looks not too good for her hometown. Looks like uh, there is maybe some of the sides um, which may be safe, but the main part is actually quite within the area that might be affected by it. Sad, sad, Maya. Um, the killer bees are coming, there is no escaping this. Uh, there's, even though um, there is one thing that could save her eventually, which is uh, that in five days um, in the future, the weather forecast says there is coming a lot of bad weather in. So if like, um, it takes the bees longer to get up there than these five days, she might actually be true, uh, be safe from all of that. So um, she also starts to um, model the, um, the path forward uh, and, uh, and the speed of the bees flying up north, approaching. And um, let's see if they arrive there within time, within these five days. Yeah, said Maya. What's left for her to do? She deactivates the layer again. Um, there's pretty much a select all she does. Selects all her beehives. We already know how that goes. Multi-editing on. They're kind of infected, right? <laughs> Well, Maya really said at the end of the day, what's the moral of the story? <laughs> <laughs> All of these? No, not actually. <laughs> there are still the three spots up there. Corte Nuovo, Fimenia, and... and um, the other one, <laughs> Cornavosa, <laughs> where she is and spends her um, quiet life in retirement um, to stay there and continue living a bit more quiet, not earning that much, but with a lot of fresh air. It is, it is, I know, hard to be one hour and a half and sitting, but I uh, hope you enjoyed. Uh, we are opengis.ch. Uh, uh, we can do plenty of things for you if you need any help. We have a sponsoring booth over there in front of, where, uh, of the theater where all the sponsoring are. And um, 
Yeah, we, we do offer support and customization and uh, whatever you need around QGIS, PostGIS. We, we know the tools fairly well, as you saw. I'd like to thanks a lot. Um, uh, yeah, Qfield, obviously. <laughs> uh, like to thanks a lot Mario as well, which in the background was running the whole thing, and <laughs> Matthias for for helping out talking as well, and um, and Marco <laughs> talking also. And if you need anything, come over, follow us. Um, the beers we produced uh, are unfortunately already all finished, but uh, thanks a lot again. Have a great uh, end of the of the day and end of the conference. Bye bye.